Hi listeners, welcome to my channel The Classic Audio Books. This channel is for growing interest of all listeners to books that helps you to know about the books and writer as well. We always request you if you like the audio book after listening, you must have to buy that book and read for respect to writer and their hard work. And now don't skip, keep listening. Today I am going read the book The Glass Palace written by Amitav Ghosh. The Glass Palace is a historical novel by Indian writer Amitav Ghosh. The novel is set in Burma, Bengal, India, and Malaya, spans a century from the Third Anglo-Burmese War and the consequent fall of the Konbaung dynasty in Mandalay through the Second World War to late 20th century. Through the stories of a small number of privileged families, it illuminates the struggles that have shaped Burma, India, and Malaya into the places they are today. I also so excited to engage in reading season of this book so let's start The Glass Palace Amitav Ghosh part 1 Mandalay chapter 1 there was only one person in the food stall who knew exactly what that sound was that was rolling in across the plain along the silver curve of the rewardi to the western wall of Mandalay's fort his name was Rajkumar and he was an Indian a boy of 11 not an authority to be relied upon The noise was unfamiliar and unsettling, a distant booming followed by low, stuttering growls. At times it was like the snapping of dry twigs, sudden and unexpected. And then, abruptly, it would change to a deep rumble, shaking the food stall and rattling its steaming pot of soup. The stall had only two benches and they were both packed with people sitting pressed up against each other. It was cold, the start of central Burma's brief, but chilly winter and the sun had not risen high enough yet to burn off the damp mist that had drifted in at dawn from the river. When the first booms reached the stall there was a silence, followed by a flurry of questions and whispered answers. People looked around in bewilderment. What is it? Bala, what can it be? And then Rajkumar's sharp, excited voice cut through the buzz of speculation. English cannon he said in his fluent but heavily accented Burmese they're shooting somewhere up the river heading in this direction frowns appeared on some customers faces as they noted that it was the serving boy who had spoken and that he was a kala from across the sea an indian with teeth as white as his eyes and skin the color of polished hardwood he was standing in the center of the stall holding a pile of chipped ceramic bowls he was grinning a little sheepishly as though embarrassed to parade his precocious knowingness his name meant prince but he was anything but princely in appearance with his oil splashed vest his untidily knotted longi and his bare feet with their thick slippers of cloosed skin when people asked how old he was he said 15 or sometimes 18 or 19 for it gave him a sense of strength and power to be able to exaggerate so wildly to pass himself off as grown and strong in body and judgment when he was in fact not much more than a child but he could have said he was 20 and people would still have believed him for he was a big burly boy taller and broader in the shoulder than many men and because he was very dark it was hard to tell that his chin was as smooth as the palms of his hands innocent of all but the faintest trace of fuzz it was chance alone that was responsible for rajkumar's presence in mandalay that november morning his boat the sampan on which he worked as a helper and errand boy had been found to need repairs after sailing up the rewardi from the bay of bengal the boat owner had taken fright on being told that the work might take as long as a month possibly even longer he couldn't afford to feed his crew that long he decided some of them would have to find other jobs rajkumar was told to walk to the city a couple of miles inland at a bazaar opposite the west wall of the fort he was to ask for a woman called macho she was half indian and she ran a small food stall she might have some work for him and so it happened that at the age of 11 walking into the city of Mandalay Rajkumar saw for the first time a straight road by the sides of the road there were bamboo walled shacks and palm thatched shanties paths of dung and piles of refuse but the straight course of the road's journey 
was unsmudged by the clutter that flanked it, it was like a causeway. Cutting across a choppy sea, its lines led the eye right through the city, past the bright red walls of the fort to the distant pagodas of Mandalay Hill. Shining like a string of white bells upon the slope. For his age, Rajkumar was well-traveled. The boat he worked on was a coastal craft that generally kept to open waters, plying the long length of Chaw that joined Burma to Bengal. Rajkumar had been to Chittagong and Bissing and any number of towns and villages in between. But in all his travels he had never come across thoroughfares like those in Mandalay. He was accustomed to lanes and alleys that curled endlessly around themselves. So that you could never see beyond the next curve. Here was something new, a road that followed a straight, unvarying course bringing the horizon right into the middle of habitation. When the fort's full immensity revealed itself, Rajkumar came to a halt. In the middle of the road, the citadel was a miracle to behold, with its mile-long walls and its immense moat. The crenellated ramparts were almost three stories high, but of a soaring lightness, red in color, and topped by ornamented gateways with seven-tiered roofs. Long straight roads radiated outwards from the walls, forming a neat geometrical grid. So intriguing was the ordered pattern of these streets that Rajkumar wandered far afield, exploring. It was almost dark by the time he remembered why he'd been sent to the city. He made his way back to the fort's western wall and asked for Macho. Macho, she has a stall where she sells food, bayagyor and other things. She's half Indian. Ah, Macho, it made sense that this ragged-looking Indian boy was looking for Macho. She often had Indian strays working at her stall. There she is, the thin one. Macho was small and harried looking, with spirals of wiry hair hanging over her forehead, like a fringed awning. She was in her mid-thirties. More Burmese than Indian in appearance. She was busy frying vegetables, squinting at the smoking oil from the shelter of an upthrust arm. She glared at Rajkumar suspiciously. What do you want? He had just begun to explain about the boat and the repairs and wanting. A job for a few weeks when she interrupted him. She began to shout, at the top of her voice, with her eyes closed, what do you think, I have jobs under my armpits, to pluck out in hand to you. Last week a boy ran, away with two of my pots, who's to tell me you won't do the same, and so on. Rajkumar understood that this outburst was not aimed directly at him, that it had more to do with the dust, the splattering oil, and the price of vegetables than with his own presence or with anything he had said. T. Lowered his eyes and stood there stoically, kicking the dust until she was done. She paused, panting, and looked him over. Who are your parents? She said at last, wiping her streaming forehead on the sleeve of her sweet-stained. Engi, I don't have any. They died. She thought this over, biting her lip. All right, get to work, but remember, you're not going to get much more than three meals and a place to sleep. He grinned. That's all I need. Macho's stall consisted of a couple of benches, sheltered beneath the stilts of a bamboo walled hut. She did her cooking sitting by an open fire, perched on a small stool. Apart from fried bayagyo, she also served noodles and soup. It was Rajkumar's job to carry bowls of soup and noodles to the customers. In his spare moments he cleared away the utensils, tended the fire and shredded vegetables for the soup pot. Macho didn't trust him with fish or meat and chopped them herself with a grinning, shot hindled. Da. In the evenings he did the washing up, carrying bucketfuls of utensils over to the fort's moat. Between Macho's stall and the moat there lay a wide, dusty roadway that ran all the way around the fort, forming an immense square. Rajkumar had only to cross this apron of open space to get to the moat. Directly. Across from Macho's stall lay a bridge that led to one of the fort's smaller entrances, the funeral gate. He had cleared a pool under the bridge by pushing away the lotus pads that covered the surface of the water. This had become his spot, it was there that he usually did his washing and bathing under the bridge, with the wooden planks above serving as his ceiling and shelter.
On the far side of the bridge lay the walls of the fort. All that could be seen of its interior was a nine-roofed spire that ended in a glittering gilded umbrella. This was the great golden HTI of Burma's kings. Under the spire lay the throne room of the palace, where the Bo, king of Burma, held court with his chief consort, Queen Supailat. Rajkumar was curious about the fort, but he knew that for those such as himself its precincts were forbidden ground. Have you ever been inside? He asked Macho one day. The fort, I mean. Oh yes. Macho nodded importantly. Three times, at the very least. What is it like in there? It's very large, much larger than it looks. It's a city in itself, with long roads and canals and gardens. First you come to the houses of officials and noblemen, and then you find yourself in front of a stockade made of huge teak wood posts. Beyond lie the apartments of the royal family and their servants, hundreds and hundreds of rooms, with gilded pillars and polished floors. And right at the center there is a vast hall that is like a great shaft of light, with shining crystal walls and mirrored ceilings. People call it the glass palace. Does the king ever leave the fort? Not in the last seven years. But the queen and her maids sometimes walk along the walls. People who've seen them say that her maids are the most beautiful women in the land. Who are they, these maids? Young girls, orphans, many of them just children. They say that the girls are brought to the palace from the far mountains. The queen adopts them and brings them up and they serve as her handmaids. They say that she will not trust anyone but them to wait on her and her children. When do these girls visit the gateposts, said Rajkumar. How can one catch sight of them? His eyes were shining, his face full of eagerness. Macho laughed at him. Why, are you thinking of trying to get in there, you fool of an Indian? You coal black color, they'll know you from a mile off and cut off your head. That night, lying flat on his mat, Rajkumar looked through the gap between his feet and caught sight of the gilded HTI that marked the palace, it glowed like a beacon in the moonlight. No matter what Macho said, he decided he would cross the moat before he left Mandalay, he would find a way in. Macho lived above the stall in a bamboo walled room that was held up by stilts. A flimsy splinter studded ladder connected the room to the stall. Below, Rajkumar's nights were spent under Macho's dwelling, between the stilts, in the space that served to seat customers during the day. Ma, Cho's floor was roughly put together from planks of wood that didn't quite fit. When Macho lit her lamp to change her clothes, Rajkumar could see her clearly through the cracks in the floor. Lying on his back, with his fingers knotted behind his head, he would look up unblinking as she untied the angi that was knotted loosely around her breasts. During the day Macho was a harried and frantic termagant, racing from one job to another, shouting shrilly at everyone who came her way. But at night, with the day's work done, a certain languor entered her movements. She would cup her breasts and air them, fanning herself with her hands. She would run her fingers slowly through the cleft of her chest past the pout of her belly, down to her legs and thighs. As he watched her, from below, Rajkumar's hand would snake slowly past the knot of his longi, down to his groin. One night Rajkumar woke suddenly to the sound of a rhythmic creaking in the planks above, along with moans and gasps and urgent drawings of breath. But who could be up there with her? He had seen no one going in. The next morning, Rajkumar saw a small, bespectacled, owl-like man climbing down the ladder that led to Macho's room. The stranger was dressed in European clothes, a shirt, trousers and a pith hat. Subjecting Rajkumar to a grave and prolonged regard, the stranger ceremoniously raised his hat. How are you? He said. Kaisa hai. Sab kuch teek thak. Rajkumar understood the words perfectly well, they were what he might have expected an Indian to say, but his mouth still dropped open in surprise. Since coming to Mandalay he had encountered many different kinds of people, but this stranger belonged with none of them. His clothes were those of a European and he seemed to know Hindustani. 
and yet the cast of his face was that of neither a white man nor an Indian. He looked, in fact, to be Chinese. Smiling at Rajkumar's astonishment, the man doffed his hat again before. Disappearing into the bazaar, who was that? Rajkumar said to Macho when she came down the ladder. The question evidently annoyed her and she glared at him to make it clear that she would prefer not to answer. But Rajkumar's curiosity was aroused now and he persisted. Who was that? Macho. Tell me. That is. Dot dot quote. Macho began to speak in small, explosive bursts as though her words were being produced by upheavals in her belly. That is. Dot dot. My teacher. Dot dot. My Sayagi. Your teacher. Yes. He teaches me. He knows about many things. Dot dot quote. What things? Never mind. Where did he learn to speak Hindustani? Abroad, but not in India. He's from somewhere in Malaya. Malacca. I think. You should ask him. What's his name? It doesn't matter. You will call him Saya, just as I do. Just Saya. Saya John. She turned on him in exasperation. That's what we all call him. If you want to know any more, ask him yourself. Reaching into her cold cooking fire, she drew out a handful of ash and threw it at Rajkumar, who said you could sit here talking all morning. You half wit Kala, now you get busy with your work. There was no sign of Saya John that night or the next. Macho, said Rajkumar, what's happened to your teacher? Why, hasn't he come again? Macho was sitting at her fire, frying by a gear, peering into the hot oil. She said shortly, he's away. Where? In the jungle. Dot dot quote. The jungle. Why? He's a contractor. He delivers supplies to teak camps. He's away most of the time. Suddenly the ladle dropped from her grasp and she buried her face in her hands. Hesitantly Rajkumar went to her side. Why are you crying, macho? He ran a hand over her head in an awkward gesture of sympathy. Do you want to marry him? She reached for the folds of his frayed longi and dabbed at her tears. With the bunched cloth, his wife died a year or two ago. She was Chinese. From Singapore, he has a son, a little boy. He says he'll never marry. Again, maybe he'll change his mind. She pushed him away with one of her sudden gestures of exasperation. You don't understand, you thick-headed Kala. He's a Christian. Every time he comes to visit me, he has to go to his church to pray and ask forgiveness. Do you think I would want to marry a man like that? She snatched her ladle off the ground and shook it at him. Now you get back to work or I'll fry your black face in hot oil. A few days later Saya John was back. Once again he greeted Rajkumar. In his broken Hindustani, Kaisa hai. Sab kuch teek thak. Rajkumar fetched him a bowl of noodles and stood watching as he ate. Saya, he asked at last in Burmese, how did you learn to speak an Indian language? Saya John looked up at him and smiled. I learned as a child, he said. For I am, like you, an orphan, a foundling. I was brought up by Catholic priests in a town called Malacca. These men were from everywhere. Portugal, Macau, Goa. They gave me my name, John Martins, which was not what it has become. They used to call me Joao, but I changed this. Later to John, they spoke many languages, those priests, and from Thay. Gones I learnt a few Indian words. When I was old enough to work I went to Singapore, where I was for a while an orderly in a military hospital. The soldiers there were mainly Indians, and they asked me this very question, how is it that you, who look Chinese and carry a Christian name, can speak our language? When I told them how this had come about, they would laugh and say, You are a dhobi ka kutta, a washerman's dog, naghar ka naghat ka, you don't belong anywhere, either by the water or on land, and I'd say yes, that is exactly what I am. He laughed with an infectious hilarity, and Rajkumar joined in. One day Saya John brought his son to the stall. The boy's name was Matthew, and he was seven, a handsome, bright-eyed child with an air of Precocious self-possession, he had just arrived from Singapore, where he lived with his mother's family and studied at a well-known missionary school. A couple of times each year, Saya John arranged for him to come 
over to Burma for a holiday. It was early evening, usually a busy time at the stall, but in honor of her. Visitors, Macho decided to close down for the day. Drawing Rajkumar aside, she told him to take Matthew for a walk, just for an hour or so. There was a PWE on at the other end of the fort, the boy would enjoy the fairground bustle. And remember, here her gesticulation became fiercely incoherent. Not a word about, dot dot quote, don't worry, Rajkumar gave her an innocent smile. I won't say anything, about your lessons, idiot Kala, bunching out her fists, she rained blows upon his back. Get out, out of here. Rajkumar changed into his one good longi and put on a frayed penny. West that Macho had given him. Saya John pressed a few coins into his palm. Buy something, for the both of you, treat yourselves. On the way to the PWE, they were distracted by a peanut seller. Matthew was hungry and he insisted that Rajkumar buy them both armloads of peanuts. They went to sit by the moat with their feet dangling in the water spreading the nuts around them in their wrappers of dried leaf. Matthew pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket. There was a picture, on it, of a cart with three wire spoked wheels, two large ones at the back, and a single small one in front. Rajkumar stared at it, frowning, it appeared to be a light carriage, but there were no shafts for a horse or an ox. What is it? A motor wagon. Matthew pointed out the details, the small internal combustion engine the vertical crankshaft, the horizontal flywheel. T. Explained that the machine could generate almost as much power as a horse, running at speeds of up to 8 miles an hour. It had been unveiled, that very year, 1885, in Germany, by Karl Benz. One day, Matthew said quietly, I am going to own one of these. His tone was not boastful and Rajkumar did not doubt him for a minute. T was hugely impressed that a child of that age could know his mind so well on such a strange subject. Then Matthew said, How did you come to be here, in Mandalay? I was working on a boat, a sampan, like those you see on the river. And where are your parents? Your family? I don't have any. Rajkumar paused. I lost them. Matthew cracked a nut between his teeth. How? There was a fever, a sickness. In our town, a kyab, many people died. But you lived. Yes, I was sick, but I lived. In my family I was the only one. I had a father, a sister, a brother, dot dot quote, and a mother, and a mother. Rajkumar's mother had died on a sampan that was tethered in a mangrove-lined estuary. He remembered the tunnel-like shape of the boats. Galley and its roof of hooped cane and thatch, there was an oil lamp beside his mother's head, on one of the crosswise planks of the hull. Its flickering, yellow flame was dulled by a halo of nighttime insects. The night was still, and airless, with the mangroves and their dripping roots standing thick, against the breeze, cradling the boat between deep banks of mud. Yet there, was a kind of restlessness in the moist darkness around the boat. Every, now and again, he'd hear the splash of seed pods arrowing into the water and the slippery sound of fish stirring in the mud. It was hot in the sampans. Burrow-like galley, but his mother was shivering. Rajkumar had scoured the boat, covering her with every piece of cloth that he could find. Rajkumar knew the fever well by that time. It had come to their house. Through his father, who had worked every day at a warehouse near Thay. Port. He was a quiet man who made his living as a dubash and a munshi a translator and clerk working for a succession of merchants along the eastern shore of the Bay of Bengal. Their family home was in the port of Chittagong, but his father had quarreled with their relatives and moved the family away, drifting slowly down the coast, peddling his knowledge of figures and languages, settling eventually in a kyab, the principal port of the Arakan, that tidewater stretch of coast where Burma and Bengal collide. In a whirlpool of unease, there he'd remained for some dozen years, fathering three children, of these the oldest was Rajkumar. Their home was on an inlet that smelt of drying fish. Their family name was Raha. And when their neighbors asked who they were and where they came from, they would say they were Hindus from Chittagong. 
That was all Rajkumar knew about his family's past. Rajkumar was the next to fall sick after his father. He had returned to consciousness to find himself recovering at sea with his mother. They were on their way back to their native Chittagong, she told him, and there were just the two of them now, the others were gone. The sailing had been slow because the currents were against them. The square sailed Sampan and her crew of Khalasas had fought their way up the coast, hugging the shore. Rajkumar had recovered quickly, but then it was his mother's turn to sicken. With Chittagong just a couple of days away, she had begun to shiver. The shore was thick with mangrove forests. One evening, the Botana had pulled the Sampan into a creek and settled down to wait. Rajkumar had covered his mother with all the saris in her cloth bundle, with longius borrowed from the boatman, even a folded sail. But he'd no sooner finished than her teeth began to chatter again, softly, like dice. She called him to her side, beckoning with a forefinger. When he lowered his ear to her lips, he could feel her body glowing like hot charcoal against his cheek. She showed him a knot on the tail end of her sari. There was a gold bangle wrapped in it. She pulled it out and gave it to him to hide in the waist. Not of his sarong. The Nakhuda, the boat's owner, was a trustworthy old man. She told him Rajkumar was to give him the bangle when they reached Chittagong, only then, not before. She folded his fingers around the bangle, warmed by the fiery heat of her body. The metal seemed to singe its shape into his palm. Stay alive. She whispered, Beche Thako, Rajkumar, live, my prince, hold on to your life. When her voice faded away, Rajkumar became suddenly aware of the faint flip flop sound of catfish burrowing in the mud. He looked up to see the Botana, the Nakhuda, squatting in the prow of the Sampan, puffing on his coconut shell hookah, fingering his thin white beard. His crewmen were sitting clustered around him, watching Rajkumar. They were hugging. Their sarong draped knees. The boy could not tell whether it was pity or impatience that lay behind the blankness in their eyes. He had only the bangle now. His mother had wanted him to use it to pay for his passage back to Chittagong. But his mother was dead and what purpose would it serve to go back to a place that his father had abandoned? No. Better instead to strike a bargain with the Nakhuda. Rajkumar took the old man aside and asked to join the crew, offering the bangle as a gift of apprenticeship. The old man looked him over. The boy was strong and willing, and, what was more, he had survived the killer fever that had emptied so many of the towns and villages of the coast. That alone spoke of certain useful qualities of body and spirit. He gave the boy a nod and took the bangle. Yes, stay. At daybreak the Sampan stopped at a sandbar and the crew helped Rajkumar build a pyre for his mother's cremation. Rajkumar's hands began to shake when he put the fire in her mouth. T, who had been so rich in family, was alone now with the Khalasi's apprenticeship for his inheritance. But he was not afraid, not for a moment. This was the sadness of regret that they had left him so soon, so early, without tasting the wealth of Thay. Rewards that he knew, with utter certainty, would one day be his. It was a long time since Rajkumar had spoken about his family. Among his shipmates this was a subject that was rarely discussed. There were many among them who were from families that had fallen victim to the catastrophes that were so often visited upon that stretch of coast. They preferred not to speak of these things. It was odd that this child, Matthew, with his educated speech and formal manners, should have drawn him out. Rajkumar could not help being touched. On the way back to Ma, chose, he put an arm around the boy's shoulders. So how long are you going to be here? I'm leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow. But you've just arrived. I know. I was meant to stay for two weeks, but father thinks there's going to be trouble. Trouble. Rajkumar turned to stare at him. What trouble? The English are preparing to send a fleet up the Irrawaddy. There's going to be a war. Father says they want all the teak in Burma. The king won't let them have it, so they're going to do away with him. Rajkumar gave a shout of laughter. A war over wood. Who's ever 
heard of such a thing. He gave Matthew's head a disbelieving pat. Hey, boy was a child, after all, despite his grown-up ways and his knowledge of unlikely things, he probably had a bad dream the night before. But this proved to be the first of many occasions when Matthew showed himself to be wiser and more prescient than Rajkumar. Two days later the whole city was gripped by rumors of war. A large detachment of troops came marching out of the fort and went off downriver towards Thay. Encampment of Mayangan. There was an uproar in the bazaar. Fishwives emptied their wares into the refuse heap and went hurrying home. A disheveled. Saya John came running to Macho's stall. He had a sheet of paper in his hands. A royal proclamation, he announced, issued under the king's signature. Everybody in the stall fell silent as he began to read. To all royal subjects and inhabitants of the royal empire, those heretics, the barbarian English class, having most harshly made demands calculated to bring about the impairment and destruction of our religion, the violation of our national traditions and customs and the degradation of our race, are making a show and preparation as if about to wage war with our state. They have been replied to in conformity with the usages of great nations and in words which are just and regular. If, notwithstanding, these heretic foreigners should come and in any way attempt to molest or disturb the state, His Majesty, who is watchful that the interest of our religion and our state shall not suffer, will himself march forth with his generals, captains, and lieutenants with large forces of infantry, artillery, elephantry, and cavalry, by land and by water, and with the might of his army will efface these heretics and conquer and annex their country, to uphold the religion, to uphold the national honor, to uphold the country's interests will bring about threefold good, good of our religion, good of our master and good of ourselves, and will gain for us the important result of placing us on the path to the celestial regions and to nirvana. Saya John pulled a face. Brave words, he said. Let's see what happens. Next, after the initial panic, the streets quickly quietened. The bazaar reopened, and the fishwives came back to rummage through the refuse. Deep, looking for their lost goods. Over the next few days people went about their business just as they had before. The one most noticeable change was that foreign faces were no longer to be seen on the streets. The number of foreigners living in Mandalay was not insubstantial. There were envoys and missionaries from Europe, traders and merchants of Greek, Armenian, Chinese and Indian origin, laborers and boatmen from Bengal, Malaya and the Coromandel coast, white-clothed astrologers. From Manipur, businessmen from Gujarat, an assortment of people such as Rajkumar had never seen before he came here. But now suddenly they, foreigners disappeared. It was remote that the Europeans had left and gone downriver while the others had barricaded themselves into their houses. A few days later the palace issued another proclamation, a joyful one. This time, it was announced that the royal troops had dealt the invaders a signal defeat near the fortress of Minhla. The English troops had been repulsed and sent fleeing across the border. The royal barge was to be dispatched downriver, bearing decorations for the troops and their officers. There was to be a ceremony of thanksgiving at the palace. There were shouts of joy on the streets and the fog of anxiety that had hung over the city for the last few days dissipated quickly. To everyone's relief things went quickly back to normal, shoppers and shopkeepers came. Crowding back and Macho's stall was busier than ever before. Then, one evening, racing into the bazaar to replenish Macho's stock of fish, Rajkumar came across the familiar, white-bearded face of his boat owner. The Nakhuda, is our boat going to leave soon now? Rajkumar asked, now that they War is over. The old man gave him a secret, tight-lipped smile. The war isn't over. Not yet. But we heard. Dot dot quote. What we hear on the waterfront is quite different from what's said in the city. What have you heard? Said Rajkumar. Although they were using their own dialect, the Nakuda lowered his voice. The English are going to be here in a day or two, he answered. They've been seen by boatmen. They are bringing the biggest fleet that's 
ever sailed on a river. They have cannon that can blow away the stone. Walls of a fort, they have boats so fast that they can outrun a tidal bar. Their guns can shoot quicker than you can talk. They are coming like they. Tide, nothing can stand in their way. Today we heard that their ships are taking up positions around Mayangan. You'll probably hear the fireworks. Tomorrow, dot dot quote, sure enough, the next morning, a distant booming sound came rolling. Across the plain, all the way to Macho's food stall near the western wall of the fort. When the opening salvos sounded, the market was thronged with people. Farm wives from the outskirts of the city had came in early and set their mats out in rows, arranging their vegetables in neat little bunches. Fishermen had stopped by too, with their nighttime catchers, fresh from the river. In an hour or two the vegetables would wilt and thay. Fish eyes would begin to cloud over. But for the moment everything was crisp and fresh. The first booms of the guns caused nothing more than a brief interruption. In the morning's shopping, people looked up at the clear blue sky in puzzlement and shopkeepers leant sidewise over their wares to ask each other questions. Macho and Rajkumar had been hard at work since dawn. As always on chilly mornings, many people had stopped off for a little something to eat before making their way home. Now the hungry mealtime hush was interrupted by a sudden buzz. People looked at each other nervously. What was that noise? This was when Rajkumar broke in. English cannon, he said. There, heading in this direction, Macho gave a yelp of annoyance. How do you know what they are? You fool of a boy. Boatmen have seen them, Rajkumar answered. A whole English fleet is coming this way. Macho had a room full of people to feed and she was in no mood to allow her only helper to be distracted by a distant noise. Enough of that now, she said. Get back to work. In the distance the firing intensified, rattling the bowls on the benches. The customers began to stir in alarm. In the adjoining marketplace a coolie had dropped a sack of rice, and the spilled grain was spreading like a white stain across the dusty path as people pushed past each other to get away. Shopkeepers were clearing their counters, stuffing their goods into bags, farm wives were tipping their baskets into refuse heaps. Suddenly Macho's customers started to their feet, knocking over their bowls and pushing the benches apart. In dismay, Macho turned on Rajkumar. Didn't I tell you to keep quiet, you idiot of a color? Look, you've scared my customers away. It's not my fault. Dot dot quote. Then who's? What am I going to do with all this food? What's going to become of that fish I bought yesterday? Macho collapsed on her stool. Behind them, in the now deserted marketplace, dogs were fighting over scraps of discarded meat, circling in packs around the refuse heaps. 